what everything is. All right. Cool. So let's get started. Okay, so this lecture, just about terminology, really. And I'm, I'm going to show you some of the Levon code, um, but none of the assignments so far will, will use the code until the next class. Um, because we're, I'm just trying to get you started on, on switching your way of thinking. Right. So with structural equation, oh, don't close, come on now. With structural equation modeling, this is regression on steroids, right? So instead of running one individual regression at a time, we can actually run many regressions simultaneously. So we can look at a whole set of relationships at once rather than one thing at a time, which is really handy, especially because generally regression has one dependent variable and one independent variable. Now we're not limited by that anymore. We can have multiple independent and dependent variables. And we can actually model variables that don't technically exist. So for me, this is one of my fun pieces, is that we can take that idea from EFA, where we're building these latent variables, these factors, and actually model them and think about what their means might be. So we can actually give people scores on those latent variables that we might have discovered from our EFA. We can also um, have theorized causal relationships. So we are going to, in most cases, specify a direction that we expect the relationship rather than just correlation, which you do in regression as well, uh, with the caveat that causality is still a lot of times determined by the, by the way you collected the data and not the way you analyze the data. Um, I'm a traditional like social scientist, so we're not manipulating anything, so I don't know if it's causal, but we are predicting a direction. Okay. All right. It's a mostly confirmatory procedure. It's about halfway through the lecture. We'll talk about how people generally run sim models. And most of the time, by confirmatory, what I mean is you have a proposed or theorized model before you start. Uh, a lot of analytics and data science is, a, is about exploring and sort of poking around at things, but for sim, usually you have a picture in mind. It is a little less exploratory than traditional hypothesis testing, or even more popular, like things like machine learning, where you just kind of throw everything at it and see what sticks. It gives me the opportunity to control specific errors. Right? And so this is um, really useful because in re you know, a regression analysis, I'm just kind of stuck with the residuals. They just are, right? Um, we're trying to reduce those residuals and like a least squares analysis, we want the smallest amount of residual as possible. But now I can be specific about how error terms are related to each other. So that might be two items on my scale that are very similarly worded, and so they're not independent from each other because they're so close. So now I can model that non-independence, that relationship that they, I know they have in these kinds of models. So instead of having one error term, we have a bunch of them, and we can tell, talk about how they're related to each other. So I'm gonna kind of go through um, some terminology. Some of this we've touched on before and we'll relate it to the pictures that you'll see. So the big one is latent variables here. So latent variables are clickable, there we go, are represented by circles on a structural equation model diagram and I'll show you a picture in here in a second. There are those abstract phenomena that you're trying to model. Keep by abstract, I mean they're not in the data. And it's not a column. You could create a column from the estimated model of the latent variable, but in general, you, these are things that don't exist in the data set. Because they don't exist in the data set, that means you cannot use their, uh, a, a column in the data set with the same variable name. So this is a very practical issue with Levon. If you, um, the way that you write the model code, it will look for the 
the variable either in the data set or not. So you have to be careful not to overlap names between what you want to define as a latent variable, so it builds it for you, and what you have in your data. These latent variables are linked to the measured variables. In general, we're going to pro propose that the direction is that the latent variable predicts the measured variable, kind of like an EFA. You don't have to do that. You can go the other way. But mostly we're going to focus on analyses where the latent variable is the causal indicator for um, the outcomes that you see. So that it scores on a, on a scale, for example. And what we're saying is that it's sort of represented indirectly by those variables. I don't, like, I can't walk up and just say, okay, your conscientiousness is four, right? Just like pluck it out of thin air. It's not like labeled on your forehead. So instead, I use these scales to indirectly represent that construct. And so it's sort of, I would say also too, like there are, um, I'm trying to think of a good business example. It's sort of uh, like stock. Stocks have these like, I don't totally know exactly the right terminology for this, but you know, they have the ones that they consider hot or whatever. And they have indicators that they're using to create that kind of label for them. And so this might be that idea. It's represented indirectly by these indicators that people have decided mean that this stock is hot and this stock is falling. You should sell it, that kind of stuff. Contrast that with manifest, measured, or observed variables. Unfortunately, I'm going to use these terms interchangeably because we can't always pick one and stick with it. But manifest, measured, observed, all the same thing in our scenario. And those are represented by squares on our SIM diagrams. These are measured from participants. They might be your business data. They might be other sources. Like, um, I don't know that we would do a SIM really of election data, but it could if you had some sort of way to model that kind of stuff. Um, any data source, right? Generally, our measured variables are continuous. But they don't have to be. You can use categorical or ordinal ordered measures. Generally, picking um, an ordinal scale means that you're going to use maybe a different type of analysis so or a different type of math. We'll talk about item response theory at the end of the semester. And that's where we'll kind of look at these sort of ordinal scales, like a Likert scale of 1 to 5. If I don't treat that as continuous, what can I do? Oh, wow, that came out very small. That's unfortunate. <laughs> All right, let's see. So this picture is not that small. So let me just make it bigger here. All right, so here's our picture of exogenous variables here on the left and endogenous variables here on the right. Okay. So our exogenous variables are... Dunna, dunna, right? Oops, wrong button. Uh, synonymous with an independent variable. Okay. And so that means that it is predicting the dependent variable. Right? And so it th is thought to be the cause of that dependent variable. And in a model, in a picture, you can find these where the arrow is leaving. It is um, exiting the variable. So exogenous kind of sounds like exit in English, so it is exiting out of that variable. And exogenous only variables, so variables that only have arrows leaving them, don't have an error term because the um, formula for regression, right, is um, y, our dependent variable, is predicted by x, right, our independent variables, plus a form of error or epsilon. And so the um, exogenous only variables don't get these error terms. However, they do get variances. So one tricky thing when we're looking at these models is understanding when it's a variance and when it's an error term. Okay. So exogenous variables get variance because they vary, but they don't get error terms because I'm not trying to predict them. 
So changes in an exogenous variable are thought to be caused maybe by something you're not modeling. So maybe like age or gender or just sort of natural variability between people. And so I might say that I think that, <laughs> I don't know if I have great examples. I think that 500 emails from one person will cause IT to block <laughs> block them those emails from coming through from today, right? And so um, the cause, the reason why one day I got 500 and one day I got four from this person is something that I'm not modeling, okay? And that's the uh, distance from the conference. I'll give you a silly example. Our endogenous variables are synonymous with dependent variables. They're caused by the exogenous variables. Okay, so this is why. And in a model diagram, the arrow is coming into it. So it's endogenous, sounds like it's coming in. So it's exiting out to come in. Right? And that's um, how I keep them straight. It's simple mnemonics. So endogenous variables have error terms. Thankfully, that's automatically assigned by Levon. If you're using another modeling program, like uh, SPSS has a version called Amos, it actually will warn you if you don't add them properly, but I, the last time I used Amos, it didn't actually add them automatically. But that has been a long time because Levon is way superior. So in our case, this is automatically assigned to, to that uh, variable, just like how the variance is automatically assigned to the exogenous variable. So it handles that kind of set up for us. So remember that uh, kind of on our, I do not know why that did not render. That's great. It should show you the little um, error term, but instead it says epsilon. Fun times. Uh, it's, a, it's a Monday in disguise here on a Wednesday night. So remember that the dependent variable is predicted by the independent variable plus our residuals, our error terms. And so that translates into our um, endogenous variable, right, is being predicted by the arrows coming in, our exogenous variable, plus a residual is what most people call the error terms. Okay, and this is what you'll see on the Levon output is the word residuals. Um, actually, you'll see, error, you'll see variances is what it'll call this section, but that's what it's called. And so, if you think about how this is getting diagrammed, what's happening is the endogenous variable right, is, is uh, having an arrow go into the, uh, the exogenous variable, the arrow goes into the endogenous variable, like in our cool picture here. Okay. And essentially another circle with an arrow would come into this variable, and that would be the residual. Most people don't diagram it that way because it gets very um, busy, too much to read, too fast. But that's because it's both of them are predictors. So it treats the, the error terms as a separate predictor. And so it's kind of lumping all the variants it can't account for due to the IVs into that residual predictor. Now sometimes I feel like this is a... Um, like you can tell when someone learns structural equation modeling because the older they are, the, the more likely they are to call them disturbances. So if you ever see this sort of like delta, I think it's a delta, a little kind of looks like a music note um, on one of these models or hear somebody talk about disturbances, it kind of makes me laugh. It makes me think of Star Wars, um, but that is a, an error term. All right, so let's look at this practically here. And I'm gonna come in, I'm gonna talk about measurement models in just a second, but practically so we can tell that these are latent variables, these circles, these are measured variables, these squares. This is the example, um, the like main example that Lovon has of how to use their um, CFA, their confirmatory factor analysis function. And so we could see that these latent variables are predicting these measured variables. 
and then we get these little double-headed arrows, which we'll talk about in, in a few minutes, but that's essentially where the variance is coming into play or the error term. Because we'll talk more about what the how it builds this in just a second. So we've got our squares and our circles. Once we started to put our squares and circles together, we would build what's called a measurement model. And this is the relationship between our exogenous latent variables and the measured variables only. And this is generally what people use when they describe a confirmatory factor analysis. So not next week, Thanksgiving, but the next week, we're going to talk about how to do path models. So we're going to work with measured variables only first. But once we start adding latent variables, we're going to start in on our big section on CFA. And so CFA, remember, is, is um, kind of like a second step often to EFA, so exploratory factor analysis to confirmatory factor analysis. So you can kind of imagine these three scales, visual, textual, and speed, being subscales on an EFA that are measured by these three items each. And so what we see is that this is called the measurement model because it's how our indirect measurement of those latent variables. Contrast that with the um, a full model or the uh, structural component of the model. All right, I don't know why it doesn't say the structural component <laughs> here, but a full sim or fully latent sim is where I have the measurement model plus some sort of causal relationship between latent variables. And the causal relationship between them is called the structural model. And not to be confused with the terminology, structural equation model, but it's measurement model, like this section here for speed, this section here for text, and the structural component, this relationship of speed predicting visual. And then I have another cute tiny diagram. <laughs> so let's open that one. Here's another picture of a full sim, just to um, help you see how this might be measured. Okay. Um, the structural model is up here at the top where one latent is predicting another. You could have a measured variable predicting, right? Uh, this would just be any section that's not the measurement model. This piece over here is the measurement model. They're both going to have either residuals or errors. You can call them either one. And so this, would, this diagram includes the, the error terms. That's what these are out here. You do not often see them um, actually printed this way because in the instant you have more than four or five squares it gets really messy and that's why on our diagrams here they're they're just represented by this little um, kind of horseshoe shape rather than a full another circle all right so <clears throat> with our full models Okay, our fully latent models. We can have models that are recursive, so the arrows only go in one direction. And what that means is like at the fully structural level, the arrows only kind of like go out. They don't ever circle back. I find this incredibly confusing because the word recursive to me means repeating. Right, so you would think that it means going backwards, but in this sense it only like tumbles forwards. And then uh, some of the code has popped up here, and I thought I had told the rest of the code to show up, but I'll rerun this and make sure all the code pops up and upload it for you guys tonight. Um, yeah, I haven't missed just a whole lot here on some of these codes. I'm having a day, right? But we're ha what we've seen so far is just some of this some of this sympath stuff. So sympaths here is a way that we can draw pictures. And so we're going to um, start using that pretty soon to help us make pictures to be able to understand if we've diagrammed what we thought we meant to diagram. And so that's what this is doing. It's taking a, a full a model and drawing us a picture of it. A non-recursive model is where the arrows kind of go backwards. And so I, I didn't do a whole lot of... Um, of 
manipulating of the basic sim path, so it kind of didn't draw it in that star shape. But what we see is that you have uh, visual predicts text, which predicts speed, which then goes back and predicts visual. So it kind of makes this like triangle shape where they all kind of in a circle predict each other. That's considered a non-recursive model because it goes back to a, a, a variable that, um, you know, it kind of predicts one, predicts two, predicts three, and then it goes back and predicts one. Okay. All right. I will tell you that it does not really like you doing non-recursive models. They'll run, but it's kind of an, an interesting problem if you are causally saying that visual comes first and then also putting it last. Let's talk some more about these pictures. So kind of a recap. The circles are the latent variables, okay? Or a circle could represent an error term, but in the pictures we've been looking at, the error terms are these horseshoe arrows. These things do not have numbers in the data set. So there are numbers on this diagram, when we'll get to what they are in a second, but those are not physical numbers in the data set. These squares are our measured or manifest variables and those are numbers in the data set. And that's just a very practical thing to keep in mind when writing the code for these. A single headed arrow predicts the, is the like directed, predicted direction of the relationship for its X arrow into Y or exogenous into endogenous. A double headed arrow indicates either variance or covariance. So this is not a predictive relationship. It's they vary kind of together. So, all right, I've got my picture. And then the picture had numbers on it. So what are those numbers? What do they mean? We can get kind of a couple of forms of a solution. So we can start by creating a model with unstandardized estimates. This is kind of like running just a regular linear model and looking at the coefficients. Those coefficients are unstandardized, so a single-headed arrow is um, between variables. So between measured variables, well, it's actually not even between measured variables. That's probably a typo. Between um, two variables could be a regression. And so I don't know the best way to, to change the phrasing on that, but uh, let me show you. So a regression here is anytime you have X predicting Y and it's not a, a latent variable to its manifest variables. So it's not really between measured variables, it's kind of a typo there. Um, so here, this one predicting this one is a single headed arrow, it only has one head on it, and that is considered a regression. So I'll change that measure. So between measured or between latent variables, um, that would be considered a regression. And that is what you'll see in the output. You'll see it's a regression and it'll have this single tilde. Okay. So one thing I really love about Levon is that it gives you clues to the code throughout the output. So the way you write regressions is just like you write them in LM. Okay. Y is predicted by the tilde X. So all of that information about running regular linear models can move over into running multiple linear models at once, basically. Between measured and latent variables, okay, and, and in the code it'll say latent variables, and then it'll say equals tilde. So that one is a special symbol for build me a latent variable. And what those are interpreted as are B coefficients. Just like regression, it's a relationship between two variables. As x increases, y either goes up if b is positive or goes down if b is negative. So for every one unit increase in x, we get b unit increases in y, which is the same interpretation as regression. A double-headed arrow okay, is a covariance. So covariance is two tildes. It's the amount by which two variables 
vary together. It's such a terrible way to say this. It's the amount that they go up together or go down together or go up and then down together. Okay. So an unstandardized estimate is covariance between two different variables. Or um, it could be uh, also listed as just a variance. Okay. The variances, though, I um, is also still two, two tildes. So this is co or regular variance. Okay. So in the output, it'll say variances as well. Um, but those are still written as two tildes. Now a quick reminder that covariance is not scaled. Correlation is scaled, but covariance is not. So all of our covariance estimates are in the scale of the data so that the, it can be quite large because it's a squared variable. And so I would tell you to never interpret the unstandardized estimate because it would be um, kind of difficult to know what those numbers meant. So on that note, let's look at where these are in the output. Okay, so I'm kind of showing you some output from a model I ran, um, a HID, but I ran at the beginning. We're going to skip some of the stuff at the beginning and I'm going to come back to it. But here are the interesting parts you want to look for. So latent variables here. See how it shows you the equals tilde. So our visual latent variable is comprised of x1, x2, x3. Our estimates here, just like in LM, it says estimate. Then you get the standard error, the z-score, and the p-value. We'll talk in a little bit about why there's nothing here. We'll get the regressions, so visual being um, predicted by speed. And so that's a B estimate. For every one unit increase in speed, we get 0.83 unit, units in visual. Our covariance is here with two tildes. And then just the variance. Okay, it doesn't actually show you the tildes, but essentially when, if you were writing the Levon code to, to edit a variance, which we will do, you would say x1 tilde tilde x1. It's a little weird because you're talking about the variance with itself, but this is how you set a parameter like variance. Okay. Now they always come up with this little dot in front of them. It doesn't really mean anything um, except that those are, okay, the ones with the dots are error terms okay, because those are our y variables and the ones without the dots are endogenous only. So, yeah, so visual here gets a dot because it's predicted by speed, but text and speed don't get the dots because those are just variances. Very practically, that doesn't mean a whole lot when you're running these. Um, I think it helps to know that some of these are variances and some of these are errors, but when I am like looking at some of this output and trying to fix maybe a broken model, it very practically does not matter <laughs> which one it is. Because if one of them is broken, you fix it the same way. All right. So let's talk about the standardized estimates now. Okay. There are several ways to standardize the model. Okay, and we're going to talk about that more later. So right now we're just going to say, if I standardize the model, what do I interpret these values as? Okay. Our single-headed arrows. Um, so for regressions, these are the, B, the beta coefficients. Um, which is kind of like a z-scored b. Now it's z-scored, so it can be negative, and it can be bigger than 1. Okay. So it just like regression, it's beta. Okay. Our latent variables actually become a correlation. Okay. And every once in a while they'll get slightly over 1, but just, this is more like EFA. So EFA, the loadings, are the relationship of the item to the factor, and those are correlations just like here. So I could still call it beta, I guess, but I think it's useful to know that those should not go over one. And generally I'm going to call those loadings to indicate that it's part of the measurement model and it's the relationship between a latent and its measured variables. The double-headed arrows, covariance, it's correlation after you standardize it. The correlations are easy to interpret, right? They run from negative one to one. Zero means no relationship, right? One means a great perfect relationship. And that standardization is going to be very helpful for us because one of the ways that these models break 
is that they'll estimate a correlation of like 1.2, which is not possible. And so that's when you know something's wrong. Uh, so this is why I'd say never interpret the unstandardized solution for covariance. Always look at correlation. But if you standardize it, the name in the output doesn't change. It just shows you a new column. So I think it's important to know that that covariance one is the correlation. You guys, I'm having a struggle <laughs> with my computer tonight. All right. Another cool thing that you can get in the output is R squared. Uh, you'll see textbooks call this squared multiple correlations or SMCs. It's just a fancy name for R squared. And that is the amount of variance accounted for in an endogenous variable. So you will not get R squared values for exogenous only variables because they are just X. You're not predicting them. So you remember R squared is only for Y's. So again, let's <clears throat> now look at that same output, but this time I told it to standardize. And right now you don't have to really worry too much with the code. We'll talk about these over and over again, but I'm just kind of introducing you to it here. And so with the standardization, I get two extra columns, standardized latent variable, standardized all. Uh, so there will be two ways that we're going to talk about. There's actually a third one. Um, I don't remember what I have to do to get it. But uh, generally, we're going to look at the standardized all one. So notice how all of these are in our sort of EFA kind of loadings range. Our correlation is now 0.35. That's much more interpretable. And then our variance is here. So notice that the error terms standardize, but the variances, when you standardize them, they become one. And that's going to be important later in the lecture. And then our R squareds down here at the bottom. So no, nothing for text and for speed because those are exogenous only. But I do have an idea of like how much variance I'm accounting for in each item. And so I can start to see which items are maybe not the most useful. All right, so that's just a, you know, just a brief introduction to what are some of the terms that we're going to see. And... How does that the picture relate to the term relate to the output? So I'm really trying to drive home that the the visuals to me are going to be very helpful because you know I can look at this output, but I just have got to see it. <laughs> I've got to see the arrows drawn, and um, that way I know that the code that I have typed is the picture I was going for. And so anytime I do consulting on this kind of stuff and I'm listening to someone explain a model to me, I always draw it out. I'm like, is this what you want? Then I have something to start with coding wise. So you'll get some practice on the next assignment, taking a, a theoretical picture and converting it into one of these models. What do I do with a SEM? Right. So once I have my model, what do I do with it? Well, I could think about the adequacy of the model, just like with EFA. So I'm going to get those fit statistics that we talked about. Oh my gosh, there's so many. There, there's a really good joke somewhere about like every time a bell rings, a new fit statistic is born or something, <laughs> because there are just so many of them. So we'll talk about the common ones. We definitely don't want a model that has an error, or what's called a Haywood case. More on that later. Models that are good or adequate have low residuals and very small modification indices. And so what we can do is take the errors in a model and it will actually suggest to you things that would make your model better. And so that's called a modification indice. So it's, if I modify the model, what happens? And we want to basically not have any because that would imply that the model is pretty good already. We can use this to test theory. Okay, so I can think about the path significance, the loadings. Are those in the direction that I'm interested in? And then we can think about significance, like P less than 0.05 kind of significance. However, the sample sizes that we need for these types of analyses really tend to push those to always be significant. 
um, because that reduces the standard error. So larger samples, the less standard error generally, because standard es error is usually estimated with sample size. Um, and the more data you have, the central limit theorem kicks in, right? So, you know, kind of normals out and stuff. So instead of thinking about significance, I often think about um, size. Is this predictor going the right way? Is it positive or negative in the way I want, I thought it should be? And how big is that predictor? Okay, and this is where the standardized solution is really helpful. I could also test competing models against each other. So which model's better? Is it two factors? Is it four factors? And I can use those modification indices to tell me what might be better. Now I can think about the effect size of the overall model. So my square multiple correlations are R squared. So I can say, well, I'm really predicting text really well, but I'm not really predicting speed well. So what can I do to predict that one better? I can think about the direction and strength of the parameter estimates, which we just talked about. Maybe group differences. So this is a fun week that we'll have when we'll do multi-group analysis. It's probably my favorite thing that I do in SEM, where I think about how the same model is applied to two different populations of people. So do they act the same or not? We can also do longitudinal differences to so latent growth curves where you measure people multiple times and you see how they change over time. Now, um, most of this is sort of linear growth curves. There are ways to do nonlinear things, but nothing really, um, we won't get into anything that's like stochastic. So like the stock market is stochastic. It's up and down and up and down. Right, this is kind of your normal like um, linear changes over time. Now it says curves, <laughs> so sometimes these are called latent growth models. We can do curve linear relationships, but generally people do linear. And then Levon actually does a, a small amount of multi-level modeling with repeated measures data sets. So if you have um, people measured multiple times and you don't want to do a latent growth curve, you can actually um, kind of structure the data where you account for the fact that people are measured multiple times. This is fairly new and is not as extensive like programmed wise as some other programs. So one of the most popular M plus, uh, M plus, one of the most popular SIM programs is probably M plus because it has um, all of these features and more. And so it has kind of a, um, a, a big fan base because it does a lot of things that no one else does. And this is one of the things that I think Levon can really improve on is um, the multi-level model abilities because it has a limited set right now because I've also worked in M+. Now practically with models, the biggest issue is gonna be sample size. So with this kind of parameter estimation, we really need big samples because we're trying to model a bunch of things at once. And so we want our estimates to be settled, valid, consistent, right? Valid is kind of a different question. And so the larger the sample size, the, the more, the better you're just going to represent the data in general, right? Um, however, this is a very long standing argument in SIM on how many people you need. There are a lot of Monte Carlo simulations and people arguing over this still to this day. Um, bigger is better, I think is the one rule that everyone can agree upon. Okay. And so I've included some links to two different kind of um, summaries, charts, articles of people arguing. But the most famous rule is the N to Q rule where n is the number of participants, so the sample size, uh, or the number of data points. Q is the number of estimated parameters. Okay, we'll talk more about how, how do I know what that is. And in a perfect world, n to Q would be 20 to 1, okay, uh, or 10 to 1. So this is why it's helpful to know what kind of model you're building first. <laughs> 
so you know how much data to collect. I would say that there are some cases where you can get away with less than 100 data points. Like, let's say you're trying to model states. Well, there's only 50 of those. However, if you're doing anything where you're collecting data from participants or places where you could get large data sets, anything less than 100 tends to not fly. It doesn't tend to work. We tried to publish one one time with 98 participants that were difficult to collect, and it just couldn't, we couldn't make it work. Everybody has in their head that like 100 is the minimum. I don't know that I agree that 100 is the minimum, but I will tell you that has been my experience. Um, I generally, a couple hundred would be better. And so we'll mostly work with pretty big data sets. Um, I've worked with everything from in the low hundreds to the thousands. Um, and there's still just a lot of, it's not really any, a good clear answer. Some people tell you it's 200, but other people will be like, nah, you can get away with 50 if you have a really good model. So, you know, there's no one consistent rule here. Now in hypothesis testing with these kind of models, I kind of have like the joking steps and then in a little bit we'll talk and then I'll kind of show you a formal picture of this. But let's say, okay, I have some theory and I'm gonna write out a model. So here's what I think should work. I'm gonna get the data to fill in those manifest variables. I'm gonna build that model. Okay, it's called specification. I'm gonna run that model. Make Levon do it. And I'm gonna see, is the model any good? So, so far this should sound a lot like EFA because this follows the same procedure. I get the data, I, get, I have some theory about the number of factors, right? I get the data, run it. Look at my fit statistics. Are they accurate, you know, adequate? Do they the map? If not, update and replicate. So we run it, like try again. <laughs> and so I would say that, uh, you know, a popular thing in analytics is sort of cross fold validation um, or in leave one out sampling, that kind of stuff. Uh, not so popular over in SIM, which is kind of a pity. Uh, because generally, I think people, when they have this sort of update moment, can think of a new variable, so <laughs> you can't really cross-fold. Um, but there is a lot of room for uh, doing lots of replications, because unless you have just like millions of people in your sample, it could be um, that that model only works for this one sample, okay. which would be unfortunate, but interesting to know. When we say examine model fit, we're going to get into this a lot next week, uh, the next class, rather. But that's it's all based on the residuals. And remember that the residuals are the error terms. And we have this sort of y equals x where my epsilon didn't um, register. And um, we want those residuals to be as small as possible. Because okay? we want to predict y really well. So we want error to be small and that error is represented from the model okay so they there it's not a column in the data so it gets to be a circle if you ever see a model formally drawn with the little circles in sim paths there are these um, u-shaped errors but small error implies that the model and the data have a better match which in theory, should say that this is a more accurate representation of the relationships I'm trying to model. Now, that's the, the, the concept behind this. Once you actually start modeling these things, you should always be suspicious if your model is perfect. So uh, we'll talk about what that, what that looks like in the output, but perfect models always make me nervous because it implies that maybe you're overfitting. You have, um, and this is this is a popular term in, in, in analytics, having too many variables. Right? So overfitting a model actually tends to happen with a smaller set of variables, but you just have like perfectly predicted everything because you have too many predictions on too small of a variable set. So we'll keep an eye out for that. So overfitting is uh, something we have to be careful of. A couple of approaches. You'll find this in the Klein chapters. 
um, which I think I set for you guys to read next time, but also the burn. Now the burn book chapters that are on that's online is uh, from an Amos book because that's the one I own. <laughs> but um, she has also has a, a literal and an EQS book. Those are some other and maybe an M plus one, but not a Levon one kind of missing out. But it is a very good explanation of just kind of basic SEM concepts. So it's not the right program, but it is the right idea. Um, we could take a strictly confirmatory approach, which means we only have this theorized model and I'm either going to accept that it worked or reject it. This is more of a like kind of traditional hypothesis testing. It's either P less than 0.05 or it's not. Sim, not that easy, but it's that idea. Or I could be taking an alternative models approach where I have a couple of different models of the construct and I want to know which one's the best. Okay. And that's really common in scale development where I could be comparing an expected number of factors. Okay. So we did one where the theory was that it was six factors, I think. So we tried models with one, three, and five because of what other theories posited and picked the best one. Or you can take a model generating approach where the original model doesn't work. Meh. It happens a lot. Meh. So we improve it for further testing and sometimes that's called eSIM or exploratory SIM. I would argue traditional academics are more on the strictly confirmatory side and analytics is maybe more on the alternative model generating side. I think there are probably some like very traditional academics like myself that would just be like, ooh, cringe, ESIM. But I think it has its purpose as long as we're replicating, right? So we're exploring, we're trying to figure out what works, and then we run it again, we get the same picture that implies that maybe we're onto something. And so this is the cool picture from one of the books um, that kind of takes my uh, come up with a theory, grab the data, build the model, run the model, look at the analysis in a more very structured way. And so here's what we're going to end um, talking about is this idea of specification and identification. Okay. So these are the two pieces we're going to um, have the rest of the slides on specification and identification. And I would say identification, like most of everything so far should just be like words, new words to learn, but identification is like the spot here that um, I want to make sure you really understand. Once those two are handled, then it becomes the kind of traditional steps. Run the model, right? Does the model work? Yes. Interpret the estimates. No. Try something else. Consider other equivalent models and tell every everyone in the world and um, the, how good your model is. That kind of thing. So let's look at these two at the top. So specification is the terminology for generating the model hypothesis. So I'm specifying what I expect. Drawing out how you think those variables are related. Now, I mean literally draw here just because it helps me think that way, but um, also practically coding it correctly. So making sure you that the picture that you're imagining or that someone wants you to build, aka okay, your instructor, uh, is actually what you're modeling. Because okay, code is only as good as the person writing it. So we need to make sure that we model it appropriately. So defining the model code here. Now with specification, we can end up with some errors. But these are kind of theoretical pie in the sky. And it's often called the love error or left, left out variable error that you don't hear about until someone else is looking at your model and being like, why didn't you measure X? And you're like, oh, because I didn't think about that. And so omitted predictors uh, can crop up, right? And you go, well, that's a great idea for the next, the next round. I feel like this happens a lot um, in review for like academic papers where some reviewers like, well, you should have measured P, Q, and R. And you're like, okay, I, I didn't, I can't. But the idea is that there are sometimes variables that you've left out that are critically important. Uh, and then practically, error-wise, we just have to make sure that we diagrammed what we expected. We didn't switch X and Y. Um, you know, you didn't 
uh, forget to specify the identification correctly, which is the next slide we're going to get into. Basically, you just want to make sure you programmed it right. All right, the last section here is going to be on identification. To understand identification, you have to know that SIM is an analysis of covariance. And so not like ANCOVA, but like the idea is that you have this, um, you know, essentially a correlation or a covariance matrix of the relationship between each of the variables. And when you build your model, it tries to recreate that matrix based on the predicted relationships. And so that's where the residual stuff comes in. And we're trying to explain as much of that covariance as possible because, um, the stuff we can't explain is error. I can also, on top of that, estimate based on a mean structure. So analysis of variance is also an analysis of, of variances, right? Different variances between groups, but now we're getting into analysis of covariances between variables. And so we're explaining the covariances between you know, x1, 2, and 3 by this latent variable. But we can add to that the mean structure. So thinking about the, the latent mean, which is the, the mean score uh, as sort of combined by our manifest variables. So we can actually think about the means of the manifest variables. So we'll, we'll treat each of those models differently. Uh, mostly because it's used in multi-group analysis. Um, because it's a model of covariance, so we end up with this kind of nice pretty little square and we're shifting the, the variances around you know, we're saying, okay, this predictor is the reason why these three covariances exist, right? We're going to get back into having, um, you know, the same kind of eigenvalue vector kind of issues that we have with the EFA. And so when we say a model is identified, it means that it has a unique answer. It's kind of a weird concept, so let's give you an example. 2x equals 4 has one answer, x is 2. 2x plus y equals 10 actually has many answers of what x and y could be. And so the first model will be identified, the second model wouldn't. So we have to place enough constraints in place on our model to make sure that we can come up with one and only one answer. And that seems like, whoa, crazy, uh, but it's actually not too hard. It's, there's some general rules of thumb. And so models that are identified have one probable answer for all the parameters, you know, given whatever type of math you picked. Uh, just like with EFA, we're mostly going to stick with maximum likelihood, but we'll change that a couple of times to show you how other ones work. Now, that's good. That's the, the technical definition of identification. Practically, how do we do that? Well, it's tied to the number of parameters you're going to estimate. So we've talked about four, right? Variances uh, are error terms. Covariances, uh, path, co um, not path, sorry. Um, latent variable loadings and regressions. Those are the big, the four of them, right? And so each of those is a parameter. So it's tied to the number of parameters and the number of possible parameters, which is part of our degrees of freedom. So most software programs will help you look for identification errors. Levon does, and it will give you warnings. But the problem is it's very easy in R to like run a bunch of code at once. And it gives you the warning in a, like when you fit the model okay, and not when you summarize. So it's easy to miss. So always keep an eye out for the warnings. I always tell people, don't get too code excited. Like don't, don't run everything at, run, at once because you can miss some of the error messages. And they're in blue. I don't know why they're not in red, but they're in blue. <laughs> well, they used to be anyway. Um, so always keep an eye out for the warnings. You will get warnings. I have made assignments that give you warnings on purpose. <clears throat> so let's get into degrees of freedom here. A free parameter is something that will be estimated from the data. It's a little confusing because you think like it's, Free, so it's sort of free to do whatever it wants is the way I think about this. Um, it's a parameter that I will estimate from the data. A fixed parameter is something that's set to a specific value. 
So free parameters count against me, fixed parameters don't. And this is what you'll see in the output. We've already seen this. I said I'm going to talk about why there's just a one here and it's blank the rest of the way through. That is set as an indicator or a marker variable. So fixed parameters also are fixed usually to a specific to one. Sometimes you can fix them to other things when you're having model issues. You can, oh, there's that, model issues. Also set things to be constrained. Okay, so if you can remember last week, we talked about EFA. I said, well, the minimum number of items you can have for latent variable is three or four. Most people recommend four. You can get away with three. Here's why. Okay. And so it becomes an issue with identification if you only have three, and we'll cover that idea a lot more when we're actually programming these models. But if you take my word for it right now, um, when you only have two, you essentially don't have the right degrees of freedom, and so your model being non-identified. So the solution is to constrain them. Okay, constraints are often setting them equal to each other. So you have two of them, but you can you just essentially set them both to be the same number. Say so estimate one number, but give it to both paths. And I have an assignment where we'll we'll do this so that you can kind of keep in mind that. Um, you need at least three measured variables per latent, usually, for identification. And sometimes this is known as an equality constraint, because you're setting them equal to each other, but not any specific number. And so when we get into multigroup analysis, that is a, a very large test of equality constraints where we're setting um, group one and group two equal to each other. So do they have the same parameter or not? <clears throat> but we're estimating that parameter, so we're either making it the same or we're making it different. All right. So getting into this identification issue. I have the, yeah. So on this side, let's talk about what is being measured here. So we talked about we have three latent variables, and this is part of the assignment. So how many latent variables are there? Three circles. How many measured variables are there? Nine squares. Now we've got three variances on our latent variables. Variance, variance, variance. These three U-shaped arrows, horseshoes. I then have three covariances between my latent variables. So that's one, two, three. And those covariances are automatic on exogenous variables only. More on that next week. Um, but you're covariating them, just like with EFA. This is like that oblomen, that, that rotation that allows them to be correlated. We could force those numbers to be zero, but generally we let them correlate. And so that's back to why an EFA would not do an orthogonal rotation, because once you get to confirmatory factor analysis, which is essentially what this model is, we let them covary anyway. Okay. I've got six laden load variable loadings. Now I want, I want you to key here onto the dotted line. I said there are six. There are nine lines here. The one that's dotted is a set to be the marker or indicator variable. And that dotted line means it's a fixed parameter. So it didn't get estimated. So there are only six being estimated. One, two, three, four, five, six. Uh, there are nine total, but only six. And that reason that that's dotted is identification or setting your degrees of freedom so that you don't run out. Um, there are other ways to do it, but this is the default. And then nine error variances. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And so we're essentially counting when, when I ask you how many um, parameters are you going to estimate, you're essentially counting all the gray lines. So you could just count 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, I can't math, 21, I think if I, 12 plus 9, right? Does that add up down here? Yeah. So that would be the number of parameters that I'm estimating. And it, you should like practice counting these, which is what the assignment is. So degrees of freedom, 
are not related to sample size. Big circle, highlight, star, fancy dance right here. This is super important. Okay. You, if you're from more traditional statistics point of view, degrees of freedom is all about sample size, right? So for t-tests, it's n minus 1 or n minus 2. For correlation, it's n minus 2. For ANOVA, it's really complicated, right? So degrees of freedom are all about the number of groups, the number of people. Forget that. It's not related to the sample size in a sim model. Instead, it's related to the number of potential possible parameters, which is a tongue twister. And so the way you know this is you calculate using um, p times p plus 1 divided by 2. Okay, hold on to those parentheses. Where p is the number of measured variables. Okay. So in this particular example, there are nine manifest measured variables, or nine squares. So I have a possibility of 9 times 10, which is 90, divided by 2, 45 possible parameters that I could estimate before my model blew up. Then I subtract the number of actual estimated parameters, which in our case was 21, and so I have a total of 24 degrees of freedom. Cool, so this is what you'll do on the assignment. Okay, let's see, did we get it right? So if I print out the summary, we skipped the stuff at the top earlier, but here the number of free parameters is the number of parameters being estimated. Okay, they're freely estimated is what I keep in mind. And then here our degrees of freedom is 24. So we add those two together, that's the number of possible parameters, but we are um, estimating out of the 45, we're estimating 21. And so that number becomes important for our fit indices later. It also tells you sample size, but remember degrees of freedom unrelated to sample size. So practically what does this mean? Right? Well, identification is sort of tied to how you um, uh, set up the free and fixed parameters, but it's also tied to like just literally how many you program. So you can program just identified models where the degrees of freedom is zero, but it's really not recommended. Now, it's generally not a good sign. However, there are some special types of models called cross-panel lagged models and probably some other ones I'm not aware of that are set up that way on purpose. But generally, you don't want zero degrees of freedom, okay? Because um, degrees of freedom are used in the uh, calculation of fit indices and sometimes you divide by them. So dividing by zero is no good. Okay. So we just generally don't want a just identified model. You want what's called an over identified model where the degrees of freedom is greater than zero. Okay. That's good. You want that. You can actually also accidentally program an under identified model. It doesn't really run okay. where the degrees of freedom are negative. Okay. It won't run. Um, just identified models tend to happen where you only have a couple of variables, right? Because you're really constrained by the number of squares on the diagram. So if you only have two squares on the diagram, you practically cannot program very much. Okay. If you have three squares, you're getting more. We had nine, so we had a lot of possible options. Now there's also this thing called imperial, imper empirical under-identification. And this happens um, more often than not, you get an error for this when you have two observed variables, so two squares that are very highly correlated. And so that correlation tends to like boggle the model's brain, so to speak, <laughs> and it reduces the number of parameters you can actually estimate. And you'll generally get some sort of error message when this kind of thing happens. Also, you've done data screening, right? And by two highly correlated, I mean, we're talking like they're like in the 0.9s range. They're really highly correlated. And the practical problem is if they're that highly correlated, why are you using both of them? Because they basically mean the same thing when that correlation gets that high. So just pick one of them, you know, just take it out. All right. Even if you have an over-identified model, you can still have under-identified sections. And this is the part that gets people. And so I'm going to give you some tips when we get to, sec to, to doing some of these models on how to know.
if this section is not identified, one, it'll tell you, but two, how do I fix it? Um, so in general, how do I create this model? Like, like uh, we're going to get into the actual coding part next time, but like practically, like what is the way that we solve this? And this is where that scaling comes in. So some people call this scaling, some people call this reference variable, some people call these marker variables, there's lots of names for this. But essentially standardization, of not standardization, scaling of the model is the right term. And this is generally some parameter you set to one. You might do it on a manifest variable, which is what we saw in our picture that we were doing with the dotted lines. You might scale the model on the latent variable where the variances are set to one. So when we were looking at the output, the standardized output, it switched from being a number to one, that's what happens. So we can either scale on the marker variables or the manifest variables, or we can scale on the latent variable variance. And this helps us increase degrees of freedom and create identification by eliminating a free parameter. Now you're thinking like, I have 24 free parameters, that's only three variables. Why can't I estimate those? Uh, you can't because then that section of the model is not identified. So each little section has to be identified, not just the whole big thing. Okay. Also, the model needs to scale. Okay. And so we generally achieve this by setting something to one somewhere. Okay. And that's the last part. And this is practically normally done on the measurement model component, but it can be done on the latent variables. So we can do it on either side and we'll practice both so you can see what it looks like. I leave it often as the measurement model um, because when you print out the completely standardized solution, you see both at once. So might as well do it on the measurement model and see both of them. But some models have different rules, so we'll see. And this really... Um, the, there's a book chapter, I, th I guess it must be on this next slide, but I have pay attention here to the number of variables attached to latent variable. If it's only two, that's when you're going to have problems. And so that is a warning for an assignment in the future. And I'll try to remind you when we get there. Does that marker variable matter? And inevitably you always get a student that asks this. So in a couple of weeks when you ask me this, I'm going to say no. It does not matter. Okay. So it doesn't matter if I set it to x1 or x2. If you run the model and it does matter, something's wrong okay. because the, it's still estimating on that covariance matrix. And this is just a scaling thing. So it shouldn't cause a lot of weirdness in your model. Okay. The only time I've seen it cause some weirdness is when I pick, it scaled on a variable that like literally had zero relationship to anything else in my model. And so that's a little weird, so I took that variable out. Um, and when you look at the output, the reference variable does not have um, an estimated unstandardized parameter, it just says one. Okay. So if you want um, to know what that like p value is, for example, you run the model once with that one as the reference variable, and then you rerun the model with it as not the reference variable. So you can change which one it is. I personally just look at the standardized estimates because you'll still get a standardized estimate for your model, just not the unstandardized one. All right, thanks for that. So here's an example to kind of bring you back to the output here that we've seen before. So here's an example. This is the marker variable. So it gets no unstandardized estimate here. It's the, it's the one set to one. If I can print the standardized solution though, what we see is we actually get the estimate over here. Okay, both of them, standardized latent variable and standardized all. And that's because, do, 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 what's happening is instead of being on the measured variable, the standard, the scaling is now on the latent variable. And so this is why I always say do it on the measured variables because you can see both outputs. I can see the one where it's on the latent measured variable and the one where it's on the latent variable at the same time. So I don't need to pick a side, basically. But what's happening is it's switching from the bottom of the model, right, to the top of the model. So something is always set to one somewhere for degrees of freedom purposes. 
but looking at the standardized solution allows me to look at all of them so that I can see that this is still a good item. And that's how you know what it is. When you standardize, it basically flips to the other side. So it's not like it's just magically pulling this number out of thin air. It's calculating a slightly different solution. So if I have a complex model, so we'll be building up to complex models. Start small. Build the measurement models first. Make sure they run. <laughs> Can't tell you the number of times people have built these like huge models and they don't run. I'm like, what's wrong? I'm like, I don't, is this part run? They're like, I don't know. I was like, try this part, see if it runs. And then this part, see if it runs. And then combine those two, does it still run? And then you'll figure out where it might be breaking. Okay. Because measurement models have very simple rules to start with then work up by adding more variables and see when it blows up because you'll have models blow up and by blow up I mean they don't run. Um, Levon does give you some some good warnings mostly some days and then in the Klein chapter which I think I need to put online for you guys um, as part of the next section but uh, around 130, there's a like table of just some simple ref rules for identification. So if you're like, I don't remember, you can go back and look at that. <clears throat> All right, so I want to end on errors. So we've gotten to identification, <clears throat> which is the most common error. We forget to do something correctly. But the other error that you can have deals with positive, with positive definite matrices. So I'm not going to go super crazy into the math. I just want to give you the basic idea of what this is, because you will see this error message. I have an assignment where it will give you this problem okay, on purpose. And often the message is that the Hessian matrix is not definite. Okay. Ah, no good, right? And what that means could be one of many things, but here are some examples that the matrix is singular, which um, means that the matrix can't be inverted. Often singular matrices happen because two items are perfectly correlated or some sort of linear transform. So if you have, you know, um, one column and then you add four and you have both of those columns together, they're perfectly correlated. So it's going to give you this error message. You can get negative eigenvalues. And remember that eigenvalues are estimates of variance, so they can't be negative. You can get what are called uh, the determinants are zero or negative. That's also bad. Okay. Um, that will give you the singular matrix problem. Or we can get a correlation that's 1.2. No good. And so, simply put, generally a positive definite or a, a not definite problem is where uh, the columns don't indicate something unique. So we have to have two columns that are perfectly correlated or somehow these linear transforms each other, you will get a singular matrix error. And that's why I always really push uh, checking for additivity during data screening, because it's very easy to reverse code an item and include both of them in your model because you're not paying attention. Okay. Have done this multiple times. One day I'll learn. Right. Um, and so that allows me to make sure that I haven't just accidentally included two perfectly correlated columns. Now, eigenvalues are combinations of variance, so they cannot be negative. And that can happen in some sort of rare cases, especially if things are very, very, very uncorrelated. It's kind of hard to cluster variance when there is none. Determinants are the product of these eigenvalues. So all of these things are kind of tied mathematically together, but um, the error could occur at any level. So these can't be negative. So if we get a negative or a zero determinant, it will throw this error message. Right. Or something can be out of bounds. This is the most common thing, where the data, when you estimate the model, the model is trying to estimate right from this data. And there's a section of the data that is so weirdly varying that it can't quite figure it out and you'll get um, a correlation that's over 1. And I've had this happen when the correlations are like 0 0.8 and 0 0.9, and it's just its best guess is 1, and then it blows up, because you can't have correlations over 1. And then sometimes you'll also get models that estimate negative variance. 
and it'll print you like negative 2000 and you're just like what the heck I don't even understand um, and that specifically both of those things are called Haywood cases so we'll talk a lot about Haywood cases and how to fix them as we go this semester and then normally I do a wrapping up slide but apparently I forgot this morning so to wrap up everything we've talked about we talked about um, what are all these bubbles and circles and things and what are they called what are the arrows called how is that related to the output that I'm going to look at a little bit of how that's related to the code that I'm going to write to define these okay. so like the pictures themselves right some terms and then very practically getting into like what kind of models can I run what kind of questions can I ask and how do I begin to build those models? So I have to think about their specification and then this whole last section on identification, which is one of the trickiest kind of concepts because um, theoretically it means one thing, right? The models have one answer, but practically it's a focusing on the degrees of freedom and then any issues that we see with um, matrices that aren't definite.